everybody. Did you miss me? You probably didn't even realise I was gone, did you? I hope you were really well. Welcome back to Find My Pass from Home. My name's Ellie. I'm Senior Community Executive for Find My Past. And this is the free family history series designed just for you. As I said, it's all free. We talk about family history discoveries. We talk about family history tips. We talk about history. We talk about you and your amazing finds. And we help each other out. And it's just a friendly, open space where we can all come together and just chat about our shared love of the past. If you're joining us for the first time, hello, please introduce yourself in the comments. Tell us where you're tuning in from today. And of course, tell us what the weather's like with you, because it wouldn't be a final pass from home without a wee weather update from around the world. How exciting. And also, if you're joining us um, and you've been with us before, please say hi. It's lovely to see you again. And I hope you're all doing really well um we do have jesse with us in the comments as well and um, so please do say hi to her so what are we going to be doing today a uh, really really special session today i'm so looking forward to this so looking forward to this um i'm really really pleased to welcome our guest for today um please welcome Catherine carr of the relatively podcast hello Catherine. hi ellie hi everybody no, thank you for having me it's really really nice to be on one of these videos i'm so delighted um now who is Catherine and what is relatively, you might ask. Excuse me, that's just my news alert going off. Let's turn that off. Um, okay, so um, relatively is a, a podcast and it's all about siblings and sibling relationships. And I'm just going to read a little bit about what the podcast is like and what it's about, first of all. So for most of us, our relationship with our brothers and sisters are the longest lasting of our lives. Something that, you know, can span 80 or 90 years. Sibling relationships come before friendships, romances, and usually outlive links with our parents. So on Relatively, which is a podcast you can access on places like Spotify and also Acast as well, um, Catherine, who you can see with me today, brings together siblings to chat about the connections they have with each other as adults and also what it was like growing up together. There's loads of nostalgia, loads of humour, loads of raw honesty, loads of teasing, and of course, we at Find My Past were actually really proud to sponsor the third series. So there were also some family history discoveries thrown in there for good measure as well. So, yeah, welcome, Catherine. This is so great to have you here because, of course, we at Find My Past have been listening to the new season very, very carefully because it's been so exciting for us. Um, and it's really, really great to have you here. How does it feel today not being the interviewer, but being the interviewee? <laughs> It's a really good question. Um, I was just saying to Ellie before we went live that um, in, in my mind, right until the moment we go live, I think it's going to be me that's going to be in control. And so I, there's no need to be nervous. And then all of a sudden it occurs to me that actually it's me that's going to be in the hot seat. So it feels fine. Look, the thing about making a podcast about siblings for it's only been a year and a well, nearly a year and three quarters, I feel like I know the subject increasingly well, so I'm happy to answer questions about it. And I know my sister's pretty well, so I'm happy to answer questions about it. <laughs> so hopefully <laughs> it's not like a test where I won't know any of the answers. <laughs> no, not at all. And our community are a really, really friendly bunch. They don't bite <laughs> much. Um, so guys, if you do have a question for Catherine about um, things like her career or setting up the podcast or anything like that, or about siblings please add it into the comments and we'll try and get to some questions at the end but of course because I am interviewing today I have a long list of questions <laughs> that I want to ask first so I get first dibs um before we get cracking there are some people I want to welcome who are watching the comments uh, we've got Roz tuning in from a very hot and humid Massachusetts hello uh, we've got Janet with us saying it's cooler in North Wales today with a welcome breeze no rain yet I think it's coming Oh, my native North Wales. Um, we've got Linda with us from a very cool Northern Ireland. No heat wave there. It was so lovely. <laughs> it was hot. It, it was, was hot. hot. Uh, Shirley, hello from sunny Cambridge. It was 39 yesterday. Everything was hot, even books and towels. Goodness me. Actually, funny story. Um, Catherine and I were supposed to be doing this from the London office in person. And because of the heat wave and the train issues we're now doing it like this yep Shirley would know that because I'm in Cambridge hello Shirley there's no trains from Cambridge to London today so and it is hot I'm 
I'm quite happy to stay where I am. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've got Georgia with us. Lovely to see you guys. Uh, we've got Andrea. We've got Victoria. Thank you very much. Um, I got married a few weeks ago. Um, <laughs> Liam joining us from Sundee. Is that a typo, Liam, or is it actually sunny in Dundee? That's what I know. Um, so, yeah, lovely. Lots of you here, which is great. Let's get started, shall we? Because, as I said, I have got a long list of things that I want to ask. Um, but if you do have any questions, as I said, please pop them in the comments. And we'll try and get to as many as possible. So, Catherine, I'll pass you first of all. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself, um, things like your career, and what actually led you. I didn't hear that last bit of your question. What actually led me to start a podcast? All oh, right, sorry. Uh, so I'm 44 now, and since I was about seven, I've wanted to work in radio. I can remember listening, if you're my age or older, you'll remember Breakaway, which used to be um, a Saturday morning travel programme on Radio 4, and it had a catchy theme tune. And I remember listening to that, sitting on my parents' double bed and thinking, sounds like fun. Weirdly, I ended up working with the daughter of some of the regular travel expert on Breakaway. So Maybe it was always meant to be. Um, but yeah, so when I left university, I went and did a, an extra course, a kind of postgraduate diploma in broadcasting uh, in London, Central St. Martins, um, and then started work at the BBC in Cambridge. So I'm kind of someone who lacks a lot of real world experience because <laughs> all I've ever done is make audio projects. So I started at local radio, doing radio car, reporting, presenting, producing, news reading, really, really bad at news reading astonishingly bad at news reading um really bad at counting the minutes backwards on a clock so you know working out how many minutes there are left to go on an item so you don't crash into things terrible at that and then I moved from there to women's hour which was really my goal my major major life goal so I worked on women's hour for years producing and reporting uh, on women's hour with Jenny Murray and Jane Garvey um and then decided when uh, I've got two boys who are small. Well, they're still quite small. They're sort of 15 and 13, but huge. Um, and when they started school, the little one, I thought, mm, there's no point really spending four hours of my life on the train just to go to another desk. I'll just use my desk at home and try and go freelance. So that's what I did. And podcasting came out of that, really. That was 2014 or 15. So podcasting was already established, but not quite exploded. And I started making a politics podcast called Talking Politics, which became huge because politics became mental. So everybody wanted to listen to politics podcasts. And then during lockdown, I don't know if people watching might have had this sort of experience. It was really weird, wasn't it? It was really frightening, those those meetings where, you know, there were the lecterns and we were being told to stay at home. And it was like being in a movie and it was like being put back in history. It was like it was just sort of awful and I think a lot of people's response to that was to learn how to use Zoom and try and connect with their family because we realised that we really love each other and we're really frightened and we just want to check that everyone's okay so I noticed anecdotally a lot of people reconnecting with their grown-up siblings and talking about their siblings fondly um, in ways that perhaps they hadn't really thought about them before and that's what sparked the idea for Relatively really I thought yeah, siblings, that's not talked about very much as a relationship, as that really, really, really long relationship. No one knows you like your sibling. So it came out of that. And I thought it'd be really fun to start a podcast when I was already working on two others, two Radio 4 series and homeschooling two children. <laughs> so it nearly killed me. I don't know why I did it, but I did it. <laughs> I mean, you've clearly come out on top, so it all worked out for the best. Oh, well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> a, bit, a bit older and greyer do you think as well um I completely understand what you said about you know the, the lockdown announcements and things like that being quite scary um and it was a chance to sort of reconnect virtually with people you might not normally speak to that much um do you think as well it, it, what led you to do to to start relatively was lockdown sort of gave you that sort of resetting about thinking you can stop and think about what is it you what it what it is you actually want to do and what you actually care about. Do you think that came into it as well? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. And hello to Damien, by the way, who says he's got a car in his family, Sarah Carr from Kent. Um, I think it means bog people or something. <laughs> anyway, 
no offense um yeah i think so i was just listening to another podcast today about friendship reevaluation in, in lockdown and people sort of thinking who matters what matters if the world could end because it could but now we really know it could what do i want to spend my one wild and precious life doing um and so there was a big element of that of like why not you've got nothing to lose everything's a bit crazy and then the other very mundane reason is what we're doing now I don't know if you did this before lockdown if you were an early adopter but a lot of podcasters we traveled physically to each other with microphones and plugged them in and recorded each other in a room and then we made podcasts and of course when we were all locked down there was this scramble not only to zoom your family and do quizzes and all that but podcasters and broadcasters and all these people who need to make stuff, actors, learn how to connect as well. So I couldn't have done the podcast if it was expensive to do because it was a side hustle. But once lockdown taught us all how to do it through our computers, I saw, I thought, oh, right. And also celebrities had time on their hands because <laughs> they didn't have any work. So I could get celebrities to come on the podcast because they were stuck at home, like making banana bread with everyone else. So. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, and it's um, yeah, it's, it was just a very funny time, wasn't it? Um, if you really are just joining us, um, if you're just joining us, welcome. Um, we're chatting to Catherine Carr of the Relatively Podcast, all about siblings, uh, which you can listen to on Acast, Spotify, or for free. Um, and if you do have a question for Catherine, please do pop it in the comments. Um, so over to my next question then: um, What is your relationship like with your own siblings? Mm. Um, I should just say relativelypodcast.com if you're not a podcast aficionado and that freaks you out just go to the website it's all there really simple um, that's for my mama built that website <laughs> um, so my sibling story is um, I thought sort of very very unusually complicated and weird but and I have to re-evaluate that now having made the podcast for a while and I, I realized that a lot of people have complicated relationships with their siblings the way that ours was quite complicated was that my parents split up when I was, sorry, there's a couple of vans going past. My parents split up um, when I was 11. My mum left and took one of us, took the little one. And then my dad kept the other two girls. So I'm in the middle of three girls. The little one was much, much littler. We lived in Holland at the time. My dad was an ice cream executive. Um, and then we moved back to England so dad me and my older sister moved back to England and then mum and my little sister stayed in Holland and that stayed like that until I was about 22 and then they the ones in Holland moved back but then my older sister went to New Zealand for 12 years so we had this sort of span of two decades more where the three sisters just didn't live on the same piece of earth um let alone the same house. So I think what that did for us, and I think it, it's the same for other siblings who were separated. We've had Johnny Flynn on the actor who was separated by boarding school from his sister. We had um, Porna Bell, the author, who was separated from her sister Priya. One was sent back to India for a while and one wasn't. And there's a real common thread with those siblings because if you still do love each other, you know you have to really work to have the relationship. That It's not just a relationship because it's time to watch neighbours and or whatever and your siblings just there on the sofa there's nothing coincidental about that sort of sibling relationship so that's where my insight into what it is to build a sibling relationship came from because I didn't know my little sister when she moved back and now I do um and so I value that maybe not more than other people but I know what the value is definitely that's really sweet you're gonna make me cheer up a little bit there <laughs> yeah um I'm, I'm I mean <laughs> I mean I'm very lucky I am I'm the eldest of, of three girls and um okay I, I mean we, we we've we've always been pretty much living in the same country apart from that one summer where the youngest one worked over in France um but yeah I, I, I definitely feel like I have a strong relationship stronger relationship with both of them now um, than we did even when we were growing up I would say mm. um, but I'm, I'm I'm very lucky that we all grew up very close to each other um, mm. yeah, and siblings, I wonder, siblings are funny things they are and I wonder if people I think it's a friend thing as well I wonder if people watching had this experience I'd be really really in, 
could be my research, interested to know that often when you sort of get to 40, 50, maybe you've got kids, maybe you sort of get a little bit reminiscy, you look back on your childhood, we've all got Facebook, you know, it's kind of natural for people of our age to sometimes start reconnecting with school friends that you haven't spoken to for ages because something in us wants to sort of be known and tethered to where we came from and I think siblings is part and parcel of that so you do find middle-aged siblings sometimes if they're lucky and it's there's good you know blood between them becoming closer because their parents might be dying and that draws them closer or they just sort of realize that in this big bad world they're really unusually precious yeah, I think that's very, very, very nicely put. And that's my TED talk. <laughs> <laughs> Goodness me, this is going very emotional. Um, so you've just finished the third season of yep. Relatively, um, which is the one we sponsored, which was really, really, uh, really, really fun. We really enjoyed it. Uh, Jen, who did the research for the family history, absolutely loved it. She couldn't stop talking about it. She's incredible. Um, She's incredible. Isn't she? Yeah. Everybody watching, you all love Jen. We know how awesome Jen is. Um, and she's on annual leave. I think she's on holiday somewhere nice and hot at the moment. I'm very jealous. Um, so out of the new season, I mean, I suppose this is like picking a favourite child. Um, so forgive me if I'm putting you on the spot here. But did you have a favourite sibling pair to interview and why? Um, I, I may have... I have some favourites. Um, I think from the Find My Past point of view, and it seems a little bit obvious, um, is the Outram sisters, Pat and Jean, who people in this community might well know them already. They were coding sisters in the war and they went off and did different sort of code breaky things, one in Italy and one around the coast of the UK for the Navy. Um, but they signed the Official Secrets Act, as did my step grand mother actually who died never telling us what she did at Bletchley um, and they took it so seriously of course this you know it's frightening frightening time they took the official secrets act so seriously they were sort of corresponding with each other from Italy to like Dover or wherever it you know saying well, having a lovely time and <laughs> being to a party and there's a, a young man that seems to have taken a shine to me and not up to much you know? and and then only after the war did they tell each other what they'd done and I got to talk to them they're still alive and they're wonderful and they're 90 I think eight and six or eight and 98 and seven and you know you you're talking about a childhood that stretches back to just after the first world war you know and so you're touching like like you do with the research you do on find my past you go about one generation two generations and all of a sudden you're touching this whole other world but they remember it for each other so they remember you know, playing dress up on, they lived, have quite, they were quite, they are quite posh in this sort of rather fancy house. So they had like, they visited people for tea and, you know, they played dress up and put on plays for their parents. And, and I just found that incredible that they'd been sisters for 94, 96 years by that point. And the, crazy, and the, and when they said to, you know, at the end, it just made me with their lovely voices, their lovely old lady beautiful voices you know that, that they were each other's person they'd married they'd had in you know, whatever they'd done had friends come and gone and then there's Pat and Jean at the end sitting on a sofa having a cup of tea with a saucer and a biscuit and loving each other yeah and I I that was my and the reason I love that so much is because they were, they are old. So with the help of their agent, Simon, who helped them write the book, The Coding Sisters, I went to um, Pat's house. So that was love. And then we had lunch together. And that was just before Christmas when it was things would eased up. And that was my greatest moment of Christmas. It was so joyfully Christmassy just to share that day with them and have this little sort of little lunch I know it was I got in the car and I had a big cry all the way home on the M4 because I just loved it and my grandmother was in Italy at the same time as um, the sister who was in Italy and so weirdly and sentimentally because I love my grandma so much I had a picture of my grandma in her uniform her code name was Blossom and I was like did you know did you know Edith <laughs> did you know her <laughs> just because women in the army they may have met each other and and they did they they didn't remember her, but I had this sort of fantasy that they'd be like, oh Edith, <laughs> everyone knew Edith. Anyway, I digress. I think maybe even if they didn't know each other by name, 
they may have yeah. come across each other, yeah. which would just just been amazing. And I love that you have that connection to their amazing story as well. I think that's yeah. absolutely wonderful. And what they said about being each other's person, mm. you sort of get that common theme with uh, with sort of a- a- Esther and Scylla's episode, I thought as well, where they said that, you know, they're each other's best friend and they're on each other's side always, even if they don't always agree on things. Yeah. I'm just like, yes, that's so true. Oh my goodness. Yeah. If you have a good relationship with your sibling, that is it, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, sorry, Victoria. She said we should have had a warning on this that, um, to get a box of tissues as well as a cup of tea. I know. Sorry. And a lot of relatively, look, it's not a massive um, sob fest, although people do sometimes cry. But it is very funny as well. I mean, we, I interviewed Lewis Goodall, who if you watch the news, you'll know him from Newsnight and BBC and Sky. And um, he could remember the song. It cracked me up so much. The song that um, the boys at his school used to sing about his mum. His mum was 17 when she had him, so she was a young mum and she was really attractive and really into fitness. And they used to sing this song about how good looking she was to taunt him at school. And he could remember the words and the tune and that sort of detail that all of a sudden you can kind of hear these silly 14 year old boys (laughs) singing Lewis's mum has got it going on. And he's sort of there like, oh. And he was really overweight. He said he looked like a blancmange. He was really porky and his mum was... Anyway, so those funny... It's a lot of laughing as well. Victoria, it's not all sobbing and deep and meaningful, as I promise. It's, it's <laughs> a lot of silliness as well. <laughs> um, even Janet's saying, you know, um, my brother and I argued a lot when we were younger, but now he's more like a best friend. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's nice. Absolutely. Victoria, you're in good company. I think both Catherine and I are sensitive and soppy too, so we're fine. We're yeah. fine. Shirley, that's interesting. Shirley, my neighbour, I'm going to call her my neighbour. I went to boarding school and once I left, did not keep up with any of them. Now, though, I followed the school's website as many years ago. Oh, Shirley. I'm sorry. I'm sorry if that was hard. If it wasn't hard, then thank you for telling us anyway. Yeah. And yeah, please, everybody, keep sharing your, your experiences, if you'd like to, about your own siblings, if you know if you do have siblings, because not, not all of us do. Um, but I sometimes think cousins as well. You can even if you don't have a sibling, you can also have cousins that you're really close to as well, who are like siblings. Mm. Like, even you know, I'm lucky enough to have two sisters, but um, I also have somebody else who I call a sister because we grew up together. We're not with no way, shape or form related. Um, but um yeah, we're just we are we call each other sisters because we're that close. So yeah. you might you might not be you might not have blood siblings, shall we say, but you'll have people who you think of as siblings and they are just as valid and just as important. So please talk about them too, if you have those too. <sighs> okay, right. Next question. Um let's go back to my little list of questions. So we talked about sort of favourites guests. Are there any guests that really surprised you? Um, and I, I, in a good sense, I think surprising in a good sense. Uh, so the, I, almost the two most recent ones were the ones that really blew my socks off in terms of um, stories that I wasn't quite expecting because um, I do do work for Radio 4 and make programmes where I do a lot of research and stuff, but I have made programmes where I don't make any research for the BBC. I don't do any, and I just follow my nose. And I have to say, those are my favourite. I just sort of feel like, oh, I'm just going to I'm just gonna follow that and just tell me more about that. I just want to know without being hamstrung by research. So um, I had Dr Nigat Arif um, and her brother Irfan on, and she's, again, she's on telly a lot. She's a doctor. She's on BBC in This Morning, and she's amazing she does a lot of work with women's health which is topical today menopause and endometrial blah, blah, blah. Anyway. um <clears throat> so I talked to them and you know this woman comes from a set of five siblings and her dad I still can't get over this story her dad was recruited to be an imam in um oh, I'm gonna get the place wrong Buckinghamshire I can't remember Chesham um, from Pakistan where they lived on a farm their family lived on a farm growing cotton and mango and stuff. And he was recruited from Pakistan because there wasn't an imam in that part of Buckinghamshire. And he's still serving. He's the longest serving imam in uh, England, I think. Um, And they were brought over when she was nine. So this girl hadn't been educated because in Pakistan, no education for girls, particularly in rural areas, no English, no nothing. Two siblings came with them. Two others joined after they came to England. And now they've got like a doctor 
a criminal barrister, a dentist, uh, a high-flying accountant, and a, speci a specialist paediatric nurse, Shirley, in our local hospital in Addenbrookes. And her, and she was the eldest child. She learned English best and first, apart from her dad, and she forged this path for her siblings. She showed them what it was to work hard, how to achieve, how to make the most of this free education. And then she set the tone and said, you all have to work in public service, basically, and pay back. And they did. And I, I made my kids listen to it. I was like, you absolutely have to listen to this episode because this is so that one. And then the one that's just happened um, with Tom Ward, who's a comedian I've seen live at the Apollo. He's very funny. He's got like a little Lego hair. He looks like he's got a little helmet of hair. He's very funny, very tall. Uh, I didn't know much about him. And I interviewed him. His sister had been arrested for climate protesting. And I said, oh, is that something that Tom does with you? Because I interview on the podcast. I interviewed them separately, siblings. And then together so I can it's not to play tricks but it's to do a bit of Mr and Mrs so you can get people to remember things from different perspectives it's really fun and so I asked her you know does does, does Tom do climate protesting no but he does agree with it blah 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 I said oh did you get this from your parents were they kind of hippies in the 80s 70s whatever and she said no but it does map really well onto the fact that they went to a really fundamentalist church and then joined a cult and I was just I did not see that coming. So I was I was knocked sideways by that. And their story of, I said to her at one point, it sounds like you're absolutely making this up on the spot. It's too ridiculous. I don't know what you're talking about. They ended up with all these weird people living in their semi in Wimbledon um, who were cult members. And the kids were all like traumatised and it's terrible. So those sorts of things, I thought my family, as I said at the start, was remarkable and dysfunctional and then it turns out we're nursery slopes compared to some, people. <laughs> some people's families and then they survive and they love each other it's extraordinary and I think the same can be said of um of family history as well you know family history is it's the stuff that you don't get taught in the history books you know yeah. it's it's real human stories and um, leads nicely into my next question actually have you ever looked into your own family history Ooh. Um, so the grandma that I mentioned was really, she told me a few stories, but I can remember, um, she, I used to get into, into her bed in the morning in Devon and she had this big window. You could see the sun coming up and the postman coming down the hill and we'd drink tea and eat biscuits and the dog would be there and stuff. And I did that when I stayed with her until she died. Um, and we'd always chat. That was like the time to chat. And one morning, you know, she would tell me about the war. I recorded her a lot, stories about being in the war and, and things like that. And then she did tell me about some stories. But then when I sort of relayed them, like excitedly to my parents, they laughed at me because I think they, I don't know if they didn't know or they thought they were like exaggerated. And so I'm now really shy of <laughs> saying any of it grandma seemed to think that we were connected in some way um to somebody who was an explorer whose statue is in Truro or somewhere in Cornwall but that sound you know a lot of family history is sort of beautiful and mundane and as soon as you claim something extraordinary I just sort of feel really sheepish saying that because it might be complete fiction and grandma might have got her wires completely crossed so I don't know I, that's I don't an know. oddly specific one it's oddly specific, but then maybe related to is, I don't know. Anyway, so that's the only, that's the only time I would like, I would like to look into it more. I do know that her, um, this is a good story. So her mother, I think it was her mother was orphaned in Kent, but they had some sort of weird um, Masonic connection. So that she was scooped up, as kid people often are, by the Masons and placed in um, service at Mount Edgecombe in Cornwall as a governess. And she was walking on, I think it's King Sand or Core Sand. Someone else would know this better than me, um, taking her charges for a bit of a walk. And she met her then husband, who was a soldier, fell in love with him on the beach. And because she was an orphan, they were then chaperoned by the chaplain to the rock of gibraltar and that's where they got married so i do know that we have a mount edgecombe connection below stairs and this sort of weird masonic connection which 
I have to be grateful for. Otherwise, my grandma wouldn't have existed and nor would I, even though it's a bit complicated. <laughs> uh, but I love that. I love that story because I love Devon and Cornwall. I love the idea that she was just walking on the beach and then she met this man. And so there's a lot of military, so a lot of my family's lived all over the globe, Africa, India, blah, blah, blah. There's a lot of that in our family. Just incredible. And I think if, you know, if at any point you would like to give it a go, I'm sure I'd like to help. I'm sure many of our community members would like to help mm, too. I'd so you've got that. a whole host of people <laughs> um, ready to support you as well. And uh, we'll get you making some discoveries and we'll get you proving or disproving some of these family stories that your grandmother told I'd you. I'd love that. Um, I, I'm being a bit distracted by people writing about their siblings on the on the chat. So, <laughs> Which one should so we bring So many up? lovely stories. <laughs> Lander Brothers, Pick Richard one and, and John. On the, screen. Yeah, the brothers go. lived in. Oh, maybe it was them, Land Brothers. I don't know. Maybe I don't know. Is there a statue in Truro? I don't know. The the best I have to say, the way that Find My Past sponsored relatively was brilliant. We we looked into the family history of the siblings, and it was always really nice and surprising. But the the you asked me about my best siblings, but the best family history revelation was with the author Kit Duval where Jen had managed to find this um, newspaper clipping of her like great grand uncle or something who'd uncovered a Bronze Age urn when he was mending a hedge in <laughs> in Ireland. And I thought, well, that's really random. I'm not sure they're going to really love this story or kind of be that impressed. And it turned out their, um, one of their other siblings is completely obsessed by the Bronze Age. And in all of her time doing family history, just goes to show you how good Find My Past records are, in all her time doing family history, had never uncovered anything, even a fifth, as interesting. And Kit and her brothers were going mad for this, like, this lovely picture of this Irish farmer with his sort of um, old-fashioned hat standing next to a hedgerow. Oh, it's brilliant. So It's just brilliant. The detail is brilliant. It's like with, um, I think, it is it Sophie and Edward Robinson's with the... Um... The newspaper article of the wedding and it yes. describes the gifts that they gave to each other i know it's so I precious know. the detail is it's all in the detail but look someone said you never know historic england landers monument you'll have to I check mean, that out afterwards i'll have to get I'll have to get back. i know imagine imagine maybe i could claim like something go down to the statue and have a picnic on i'm allowed to do that or something <laughs> I mean, why not? Why not? Um, remember, guys, please keep sharing your lovely stories. Um, we'll share as many as we can. And if you do have any questions for Catherine, please add them in. Uh, I have a few more questions of my own, if that's OK. Um, so we've already talked about common themes, um, a few. But were there any others that you have identified through all the podcast episodes you've done? Are there any other themes that have come out? Yeah, I think so. I think a really strong theme for me, it's kind of a paradox, which is that, as with the Outrams, nobody else knows. So on season two, I think it was season two, Nick Hornby, the author, and his sister, Jill Hornby, who's also an author, actually, she came, they came on, he wrote about a boy. And um, it had turned out with them that their dad had a whole separate new family tucked away somewhere else, and he then left them for this new brother and sister and wife um and of course only nick and jill know what that felt like so you have that that's an extreme example but only you and your siblings know what your mum's shepherd's pie tasted like or what the wallpaper in the downstairs loo was like all that sort of like texture but at the same time as that none of us are kind of born into the same family because it's like a conveyor belt. You're born, the family moves on, people get richer or poorer, they move house, someone dies, someone lives, you get a dog, you lose a dog. It's a slightly different setup that the next sibling is born into. And so even though you all have this huge common shared pot of history, you also have a different perspective on it. So you remember things differently and things impacted you differently and you related to people in the family differently. And that's why I interview people separately because you remember, you, you pre preference different memories. Some things are so important to you because that's the way you were built or an event just caught you at a de developmentally exciting time. And your sibling might just think, what? I, that just doesn't even feature. I don't even know what you're going on about. 
And I find that sort of push and pull of shared and different really interesting. And again, with my own family, that's really exacerbated by being physically separate. So that's a huge, huge theme of the podcast. I love it. I think that's so well put. Um, even Linda saying, you know, my sister is five years younger than me. Yes. And our memories of various events are really quite different. <laughs> yes, it's so weird, isn't it? And you get together and you sort of go over them and you think, I literally don't know what you're talking That Christmas was fairly average. But for somebody else, that Christmas is like the blueprint Christmas of all Christmases. And it just turned out it's because they got like a, you know, a glove puppet or something ridiculous that really did it for them. And, and you know, and it's just in prints, it just in prints. And I think with trauma and things and upsets, that's particularly important. If there's been, you know, death, divorce, separation, illness, all of those really difficult things that do mar most people's child. Most people don't escape life with <laughs> nothing. Hopefully your childhood doesn't have it, but a lot of people's childhoods do. So that also really bonds you because nobody else understands the trauma, but also you have to be allowed to have your own perspective on the trauma and your own feelings. You don't have to feel the way your older sister says you should feel about that, you know, and I think that's part of the middle age thing. You're, you can turn over those stories and think, well, I was always told it was this way, but maybe now as a 40 year old, I'm allowed to say what I think it was like, <laughs> not just the handed down narrative. And I think those conversations can be difficult, but I think they're very, they're very fascinating. That's what Janet's saying. Her and her brother recommend, you know, um, remember things differently. And John is saying, you know, four boys, 16 years. Is that a 16 year span? That matters. You know, we had Helen Thorne, the comedian and her brother on and her brother's like 14 years older than her. So she was a kid and he was in a hospital for um, having really severe mental illness problems. So she had this kind of weird childhood where she would go and visit her brother in an institution and only later as adults they get together over a beer and they're like geez what was that like for you <laughs> um yeah my my dad was the youngest of four and his eldest sibling was 16 years older than him so it's a lifetime right you barely live in the same house yeah you just cross yeah. over like that and yeah but your mum and your dad your mum and your dad and yeah. And interestingly, my dad and my auntie, they were the closest siblings. They were the most most alike and they were the closest, I think. Mm. Um, but yeah, Fasc Very absolutely fascinating. Um, How do you choose yes, which siblings to interview? <laughs> Hi, Karen. I wonder where you are, if you're in that wood. No, that's an old photo. I, mean, I can't tell. Um, hmm. So I try... I do love podcasting and podcasts um, and I listen to, I don't listen to very many. It's a sort of irony of people who make podcasts is you don't have much time to listen to podcasts because you're making podcasts. <laughs> but um, I can sometimes get a bit tired of hearing the same guests guesting on each other's podcasts. You know, you sort of, if they've got a book to flog or something, they sort of pop up absolutely everywhere. So I have really tried to do a real mix of um, everything, background and age, experience and expertise, um, interests. Um, and then getting guests is, is hard. It's, it's a hard job as an independent podcaster. If you're working for Women's Hour for Radio 4, you know, you just have to send an email from Women's Hour from Radio 4 and if someone can make it, they'll make it because <laughs> they know... Yeah. <laughs> unless it's a, exactly. unless it's a difficult interview where you want to tell them off for being a rubbish minister or something they'll come on because it's a huge you know it's a big audience um but when you're an independent podcaster with a kind of um lovely but not millions audience it's quite hard so it is a lot of my work is thinking who would be good in the mix I want a mix um because like with Nick and Jill and Pat and Jean you get so far back and then we talked to Leroy Logan who was uh, the most the highest I think black met police officer he's his um, life's been made into a film by Steve McQueen his dad was beaten up by cops when he was a kid and yet he went on to be a policeman it's a sort of George Floyd-esque sort of racial incident 
you know, that takes you to a kind of Windrush history. And again, with Nigat, that takes you to kind of 80s immigration. And I want to reach into those different contexts and communities to find out what family life, all the silly little bits of family life, what that looks like in as many different places as possible. So it's not just white 40 year old middle class women talking to other white middle class it's just not interesting to me all the time I want to learn um yeah so that's uh, you know I really I've really tried to do that um and then you know you have to some people don't really want to talk with their siblings because some people if they're a little bit famous um you know, the whole point of the podcast is that people, if they're a bit famous, they might have their story about and that's how they want it to appear. And everybody knows if you've got a sibling that they can take you down a peg or two like that. You know, don't be don't be so stupid. That didn't happen. You know, you, you were never that cool. So you have to have quite a a secure and humble and nice, famous person who's willing to sort of allow their sibling their space and to be made fun of. So that is also another a sorting hat <laughs> that you have to go through. Thank you for um, that question. It's a great question. And I'm so pleased that there is a real mix of siblings in terms of ages and backgrounds as well. Because as you said, like it's so vibrant and no two siblings' experiences growing up together are going to be the same. Mm -hmm. And you really, you really get this when you when you listen to all of these episodes. Um it's never the same. <laughs> it's never the same. It's never the same. It's never, and it's always the little. So, um, Jess Phillips, for example, Labour MP, and just really cracked me up. They just some people really go there on the memory. She was my very first guest, and they start off by telling the story about how they've been really naughty. They grew up in Birmingham. Her and her brother really naughty, and they were like sh shoved up in their bedroom, and I think they were actually locked in. Like this is the eighties, you know be good and we'll come and get you afterwards and no pudding no arctic roll for you oh karen picture is me in the spanish poncho had a matching one with my sister oh cute and <laughs> they were good ponchos they were good um yeah and, th and then they <laughs> they were in the room and they decided to cheer their dad up so to cheer their dad up they decided to create a winter wonderland in the bedroom with the talcum powder, which they had available. <laughs> so their dad had given them a really big telling off and locked them in their bedroom and gone downstairs and been like, for heaven's sake. And then he went up to get them, hoping they'd be like, sorry, daddy. And he opened the door and like the entire room <laughs> was just covered in Johnson's and Johnson's talcum powder. And, and and hearing them going back in their minds to those, and they were absolutely cracking up remembering the story. I, You know, that's their childhood. No one else had it. It's funny, really funny. Absolutely. Gosh, there's so many good comments coming in. Um, uh, Damien says, I'm an only child, but I have six half siblings, three on each side. The youngest is 16, 16 years younger than myself. Yeah. I get on better with them now than um, them all than with grit. I can't string a sentence together today. And I'm even reading your sentence, Damien. I apologise. Um, Janet says, my late father was the eighth of nine children and was not a great source of family information. His oldest sibling was about 18 years older. That's a, that's a, gen that's a generation. Yeah. Yeah. It's mad, isn't it? It's mad. That's a, that's a lot. And we have had people on with half sisters and stepsisters and, um, you know, who's, as I say, whose parents may have moved on to have other children elsewhere. And I think, like Damien, I think it's Damien, you know, that's tricky when you're a kid because you're being pushed aside and love is divided up a little bit and it feels like, um, and when you're older, you can you can reconcile and talk about it a bit. But that leaves, you know, it leaves its mark as well. Um, hello, Matthew's just joined. Um yeah, that's that's a big thing. I remember Bryony from the Bake Off. I don't know if you know Bryony. She's really funny from Bristol. And she would not do it with one sibling. She had to have both her brothers or it was a deal breaker. And they were so funny and they were so sweet that the the older brother was going to drop out of school before sixth form. But he was so worried they were going to a bit of a, um, it was going to be a bit of an, a, a challenging school bus ride. It was not, not the greatest. So he stayed on at sixth form just for like eight weeks or something so that he could be on the school bus with his little brother who was just starting senior school so that he could sort of cover him with this protection of that's my brother 
And he didn't really think that was like a really big deal. But it is. Like it really is. And they were very funny because Bryony's got, she's got one normal hand, if you like, and then she's got one little hand not fully formed. And, um, and she was just like, yeah, but I learned to tie my shoes a lot longer, a lot earlier than my brothers. <laughs> like I had one hand and they couldn't do it. So that one was very, very funny, but also sweet. You know, the issue of protectiveness comes out a lot, a lot. Th that feeling you get with your family that you would quite happily crawl over broken glass for them. I think people feel that a lot when they talk to me because the idea that, you know, what their sibling means to them is it can be overwhelming. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, um, Victoria. John says, yeah. <laughs> John says, I remember staying at my maternal grandmother's home and having egg soldiers for breakfast, but I don't think my oh. brothers have that memory. Oh, see, that's exactly it's so little. It's the detail. It's the detail. That's so sweet. Just, yeah. Also, it's made me want egg and soldiers. <laughs> <laughs> I hope um, I hope we've inspired you all to um, to go and check out um, relatively the podcast, which you can listen to on. Was it relatively dot com? It's relatively podcast, all one word dot com. And then the nice thing about the website is that everybody who comes on sends in baby photos and kitty photos, so you get to see like Gok Wan when he was little, and you get to see. Chris Packham when he was a punk and you get to see <clears throat> the Van Tullikens when they were potty training <laughs> sitting on their matching potties so that's really sweet because I quite like seeing where they came from and then seeing their recent photos of these lovely grown-up people who kind of found a place in the world I find that touching as well yeah really sweet um and yes I've been listening on Spotify so you can listen there too if you have a Spotify account and I think you can also listen on Acast as well and yeah and iTunes on iTunes and iTunes yes I yeah. always think <laughs> um but yes hopefully we've inspired you if you've not checked out relatively the podcast yet um honestly it is I've been listening to it while I've been working um listening to it while I've been cooking you can oh. listen to it while you're out walking thank you it's just uh it's really chill and I really like the mix of you get the humor you get the nostalgia you get the real raw emotion and you you know you do, you do, you do touch on some slightly more upsetting bits but it's yeah. always within a mix you know yeah and I try yeah I try and end on a perky place as well there's always a few questions like silly nicknames what could you do to wind your brother and sister up what were the rules in the house Matthew my husband Matthew his the rule in their house was he was not allowed to watch the Dukes of Hazard. I don't know if anyone remembers that because his friend Richard Bell, Dukes of Hazard was kind of cowboy country in America, and they had this orange car, and they never got in through the doors. They climbed in through the windows, and one day Richard Bell climbed in through the window of the new family car to go to swimming lessons and like scuffed up all the plastic. <laughs> so that became the rule: no Dukes of Hazard. So some of those family rules are. Funny, Bobby Seagull came on with his brother Davy, who was injured in this terrible accident when he was two. He's got no, I think he's got movement in one hand. He's an artist now and he's um works in future technologies for HSBC. Um, but you know, he was in a wheel in an electric wheelchair and very disabled. And the rule there was like you're not allowed to mess around with Davy's wheelchair. And if you listen to that episode, what Bobby used to do, like he he was a proper sort of rally wheelie trickster on this <laughs> wheelchair and whenever Davy went out he'd be like come on cousins get on the back we're off to get ice cream so <laughs> I love where these rules come from and then how they're blatantly broken at every opportunity <laughs> um I have two more questions from me the first one is if if anybody listening is inspired to maybe even start their own podcast like about genealogy or history or gardening or medieval art I don't know whatever you know takes your fancy um what advice would you give them if they wanted to start their own podcast um I think it's I think to be a little bit ruthless with yourself and ask important questions like um who is this for and why is it a bit different um you'll know in your job you know you're constantly thinking about the audience like what would they like who would it be how could we present this for them 
that sort of thing. And, and there's a lot of podcasts out there. There's a lot of books. There's a lot of films. So everyone's saying, well, there's too many podcasts I kind of don't agree with. But there are a lot of podcasts which are just um, a lot of talk without much kind of editing or thought. So for relatively, for example, I record maybe an hour and a half and then chop it to try to get up to below 30. The last episode was a bit indulgently long, but usually 30-ish, two, 32 minutes. Um, so I would say, you know, there's space for as many podcasts as you want to make. And there, and, and and there's the thing about podcasts, which is different to radio, it's like Find My Past, really, is that you're selecting a very little community. So if you think, oh, I'd really make like to make a genealogy podcast about, I don't know, tracing family members who are connected to statues because that's what we were talking about or who is this bench for or you know that would be really neat and then the people who find it are automatically interested in that because they've searched family history so if you're lucky you get this really dedicated audience it's not just switching on the radio in the car or switching on the radio in the kitchen and just happen to be listening to whatever guff is on there you create a community instantly so if you can think of something that you'd love to talk about that you think there's a community for and you could do it in a way that wasn't just you know really waffly free form um go for it it's, it's it's quite easy you know if you can do family history and all of the research that this community does podcasting's like 10 times easier <laughs> technically so <laughs> like 10 times easier um so you'd, you know and there's lots of places to go and get help and things um so yeah i would have a go and I remember you saying earlier that you sort of started out wanting to to be in radio and and things like that. I actually did a little bit of uh, radio presenting in my student days. Ah, oh. yes. <laughs> um, but yes, I've often thought about starting a podcast too. Do it, a personal one. But um, yes, it's it's just you know thinking. Yeah. Anywho, um, my very last question: If you are in a position to answer it, what is next for relatively? Ooh, well, um, I'm working on a book proposal for Relatively, um, not to make Relatively the book, but to kind of write a book about um, siblings using, because I've got 52 episodes, 48 probably are sibling pairs. It's quite a lot of sibling pairs. Um, and the stories, as I sort of uh, mentioned, are crazily varied. Um, oh, look, people saying they definitely listen to your podcast. There we are. Uh, <laughs> um that's for so, yeah. Anya, because Anya's going to start one. Yeah, do it together. There you go. We've got a podcasting partner. <laughs> um, yeah, so writing a book and then season four in the autumn. I'm kind of quite tired. I did a really long season sort of by accident because I just kept going. Um, so I think a sh two shorter seasons next if I do them. Um, but yeah, I'd like to keep going. I just love it. You know, I think I'm really tired. And then I was saying to someone just this morning, I'm really tired. I don't want to do the last episode kind of just it's so hot I don't want to record it I don't want to edit it just had enough I just want to go and lie down with a book and do something else and then you you know like family history I bet you think oh just my eyeballs are burning I got to turn the laptop off and then you find one more thing and you think oh well now I've got all the energy in the world it's like that I start talking to someone they tell me oh we were cult survivors and all of a sudden I'm like I've got energy for days I'm here this is it and that's been my job my whole career is finding out people's stories. So I, I'll carry on doing it like this, I think, for a bit more. And then I've got other work in other places to sort of get done over the summer. But yeah, and I, I should say thank you to Find My Past because it gave a whole new dimension to series in three. Um, sponsorship was lovely. Yeah, really. Um, and it just felt like I had a little sort of set of colleagues, Niall and Jen and Helen and seeing Ellie on the lives. And I just felt like, wow, this is the kind of a community that can welcome my community. And we can sort of, we're all interested in family stories. Mine's immediate, yours is stretching back, but it's all linked. And it, I really loved that about it. It made perfect sense. And I'm very lucky um, to have had you as a sponsor. So thank you. No, and thank you as well. As I said, Jen has loved this project so much. Jen, if anybody listening, um, Jen's done pretty much all the work, the research work. Um, She's astonishing. And then, 
And then Niall and Helen have been doing like the uh, the organisational side of things. Um, so yeah, between them, they've done a, a really great job, I think. Um, yeah, and yeah, it's just been have. an absolute pleasure. <laughs> it's oh, been wonderful. Well, thank you. And thank you for having me on here as well. I'm just uh, loving seeing... Um, oh, look at this. Phil Spector's work. Yes, with twins and diets. Well, you would like um, the Van Tullikens podcast, a thorough examination all about diet and twins. I bet you've already listened to that, actually. And their, <laughs> and their episode on Relatively was hilarious. Their dad used to go to the butchers and buy. He taught that they ended up doctors and their dad used to call the butchers the dead pet shop. And then he would go and buy things like cow's hearts. Really traumatic. But he would teach them about like anatomy. He didn't know. They'd get like this heart and they'd sort of play with it in the sink and work out how all the valves and things worked. And lo and behold, Chris and Zahn became doctors. So, yeah. But they talk a lot about diet. One's fat. One's not so fat. One's thin, in fact. And how interesting that is. So, yeah, twins will be in the book, Victoria. <laughs> um so Anya is going to hop on the bus on oh. over the bridge from Dundee to Edinburgh and uh, okay. <laughs> and uh, come and say hi to me and we'll do a podcast together and then Perfect. Liam is going to make a guest appearance. So there we go, we've got plans. You've produced plans it already. <laughs> Absolutely. Um so yeah, wonderful. Um I think that brings us nicely to the end actually. Uh Catherine, it's been an absolute pleasure. I know when we talk when we when we were talking before we um, uh, went live, you know, I said, you know, we normally have these at, at an hour, but if we finish at like thirty five minutes, that's cool. We've almost done the whole hour. Done <laughs> Thank you. It feels really indulgent and very lovely. Absolutely. And um, if you ever want to come back and natter again, maybe after the the next season, please feel free. And there is always a space for you here in this lovely community as well. Well, I will leave with a thought, which was I am looking to make an episode next season, regardless of what happens with sponsorship and whatnot, um, with a brother and sister pair who are into genealogy, who may have found each other either through Find My Past or found out extraordinary stories through Find My Past, maybe with an eye to Remembrance Day, but not necessarily. But I'd love that. I think that would be very cool. So that's the mission for the audience. Lovely. So if anybody's interested in that, should they email us or you. should they email you? I think email you because um, and then we can talk about how it might work. There you go. Wow, that was slick. Really? <laughs> Told you this was good. It yes, if you good. are interested in that, um, drop us an email to discoveries at pharmapast.com with some details and we'll pass those on to Catherine and then we'll get you guys chatting. Brilliant. Lovely. Um, now, a couple of housekeeping bits before I finish. Um Obviously, thank you very much, everybody, for joining today. It's been lovely to be back and to have a natter with Catherine and to have such a wonderful guest. Um, you can listen to Relatively on Acast, on relativelypodcast.com, and also on Spotify and also on iTunes. As we said, the episodes are around 20 to 30 minutes long each. Um, they are really, really digestible, really chill. I really, really recommend them. Now, Friday for Friday's Live. This is a bit of an interesting one. Now, I'm hoping to be back on Friday but I may be on a train if I will be on a train at four o'clock we're going to do it a bit earlier so we're going to do it at about 1 p.m uk time so just a heads up Friday's live might be earlier this week um, if I'm not on a train and I'm just here in my office in Edinburgh it will be normal time at four o'clock so there we go that's your housekeeping I think that's I think that's it uh -huh. <laughs> words um Catherine it's been fantastic thank you thank so much you. thanks for having me thank you everybody it's really nice to meet you and um, i'm going to go back and look at that link about the statue in truro <laughs> have a wonderful day everybody take care of yourselves bye bye, bye.